Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Carnivorous Plant Society's June monthly meeting. Today, we're going to be talking with Matt Soper on growing Saracenia. I'm very excited. I'm in Florida. Matt, of course, is in the UK. So we are really emphasizing the I in International Carnivorous Plant Society today. I am the education director. A couple of months ago, I wrote five animated videos for the ICPS on a little beginner series on how to feed Venus flytraps, how to grow carnivorous plants inside, outside, how to acclimate carnivorous plants when you get them uh, shipped to your house, and a basic video on what are carnivorous plants, how do we define them. You can watch them on the ICPS's Facebook page and YouTube page. One month ago, we had the second annual World Carnivorous Plant Day. If you go to the YouTube page or the Facebook page, you can see 26 videos. Some of them are on cultivation. Some of them are on conservation. Lots of really good content from people all over the world. If you go to carnivorousplants.org, you can learn more about World Carnivorous Plant Day. We have some merchandise available, and all of the proceeds benefit the Education Fund and the Conservation Fund. Part of the education grants and funding goes to Carnivores in the Classroom, which provides teachers in K through 12 public and private schools funds to start growing carnivorous plants. You can learn more about that by going to carnivorousplants.org slash donate. Every month we have a webinar and every month we have a virtual happy hour. If you visit our social media or our website, you can find the dates. And speaking of which, save the date. Wednesday, the 3rd of May, 2023, will be the third annual World Carnivorous Plant Day. All right, and now I'm very excited to be Zooming with Matt from all across the big pond. And thank you for all the people who are attending live. If you have a question, type it into the chat box and I'm going to ask Matt in real time. So we're not gonna wait till the end of the webinar. So if you see something and you wanna learn more, just uh, type it in and I'll ask him. All right, Matt. Take it away. Okay, good afternoon, Kenny. Hello, everyone. Um, Matt Soper here, Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. I'm in sunny Southampton, Southern England, uh, <laughs> coming through loud and clear. Um, I'll start with a bit of background. Um, I first started growing these plants at the age of seven when I was bought a Venus flytrap by a neighbor. And the reason I wanted one, I've seen them on a natural history program, and it filled the screen. It's jaws closed around a fly, and I just wanted one. I had to have one. And I was fortunate. My neighbor worked in a florist, and she managed to find a fly trap for me. And I was extremely disappointed. It was so small. Um, the traps on it were about five millimeters or a quarter of an inch across. I was expecting something this size. But anyway, I tried to grow it. I fed it cheese. I killed it. Um, got a second plant. And I did the same with that one. I think I fed it some chocolate. But on the third attempt, I was quite successful. And I managed to fill up a, a plastic washing up bowl, we call them over here. And um, with all the traps all over it, and it looked absolutely fantastic. Um, but I've been growing the plants ever since. I started our nursery about 28 years ago, Hampshire Carnivorous Plants, on a rented property. And now we have our own acre of glass here. Well, we grow mainly Saracenia, and I would say of all the genera of carnivorous plants, we do grow and sell quite a number of different genera. Saracenia are by far my favorites, and hybridizing Saracenia is what I like to do. So where we are in temperature-wise, we're in southern England, between Winchester and Southampton. Our temperature range here would probably zone eight to nine, just in the middle we are. If you go a bit south to Southampton, it's a little bit warmer. North up to Winchester, it's a bit cooler. So we're, we're in the middle. We're about zone eight to nine. This greenhouse here is a Venlo greenhouse. 
is completely unheated. So our winter temperatures inside here are about minus five to, to zero, roughly. That's the temperature we get in the winter. So all our plants in here do freeze. Uh, in the summer months, it gets extremely warm. Well, for us it does. It can get up to about 45 centigrade, which is rather warm. Um, I do whitewash the roof. I don't know if you can look up here and see the, the roof. We whitewash the roof round about the end of April. The main reason we're doing that is because it holds the plants for longer. I don't find it has any difference or makes any difference to the uh, coloration of the plants here myself, but it's very good. So we always like to wash it, whitewash it or paint it white so we get a longer growing and selling season, obviously. So let's, um, we grow all the plants standing in these trays of rainwater. So they're always very well hydrated. Um, they're standing in water spring and summer, and we keep them just damp over the winter. And the way we keep them damp, we stand a lot of them on this capillary matting. I don't know if you use this in other parts as well. This is fantastic. Um, the reason for this is because if you don't have capillary matting in the trays, the plants are either wet or dry. So with capillary matting, you can keep them just right, just damp. And that really reduces the chance of botrytis or grey mould over the winter months. So that's a really good thing to use, I find, this capillary matting. If we come up through here, as I say, we've grown for quite a number of years and hybridising is something that we really do like to do a lot of here. These are some of our own hybrids. This is a Morii here, one of our own ones, SH77. This one. 212, nice red morii. It does take a number of years to select out the best ones. Here are some that are one-offs that I've selected over the last few years. So you'll see some, some brand new ones here. We're looking for color, size, and vigor. Vigor is very, very important, I find. I don't want anything that looks great that just hangs on. So we want plants that are super strong growing, but look great as well. And here's a few examples. This is one of our own ones. This is called DISP7. It's a, a giant catspiae crossed with a flower cupria. This monster I used to cross to breed other larger plants, and we've used it on quite a, a number of hybrids. Here, like things like these, it's a very dark. This is a new one, new red mouth. I'm sure it's going to get a lot bigger over the next few years. But obviously, trying to get very, very white topped Mori eyes is a, a big thing that we like to do. And um, there are quite a number of these individual clones here very white, very red, large. It's just all the the traits that I'm sure you want with breeding these plants. This is a rather nice one. Trying to get the white top on some of the uh, Mori eyes. This is one of our own again. Come around the top. I've also been hybridizing with quite a few uh, Saracenia minor oaky giants. This is one cross with Norman Parker, which is rather nice. But to select out, to get plants to this stage, you've got to grow so many on to pick out the best of the best. So we started here, down here, and then across here. So we start, so these are about five years apart. And then you just weed out the best ones and, and grow those on. But you have to grow them on for at least three or four years before you know if anything's worth, worth keeping really. Down through here. Again, some different Morios that we're raising. To bulk them up, we have to use, we don't have a tissue culture facility ourselves. We have sent a few away and had them cultured, but most of our plants here we propagate by division. And I'll show you to do that in a minute when we do on the nursery. 
few more types. This is a very dark one here. This is a Morii. It's not extremely dark. Different reds, red flowers. Yeah. So obviously, we, we're just looking for this sort of thing. We would cross, I want to cross these types next year with miners more because we've done what we can with the Morias, I think. Now, this is a nice brown striped one here. But as, we've gone as far as we can with those, I feel. Um, some of the, the lower hybrids are, are getting quite popular now with high color in them, as you can see here. Well, it's what you like, it's an individual choice. But I think now the main thing for us now has got to be vigor. They have to be really strong growing plants. We don't want anything that's just gonna, just gonna hang on. Doesn't matter how good looking they are. Um, they've got to be really strong and vigorous. And the white ones here have a tendency to be a bit weak and slow. So some of these selected Michelianas are, are pretty strong growing. The weaker ones we just discard. Move down here, I'll show you what we do here. Now, I would say that there is no right and wrong way of growing these plants. All I can tell you is, is how I grow them, what I do with them here on the nursery. And you might pick some things up that you're not doing yourselves, or you might see some things that you're doing better. So as I say, there is no right or wrong way, but all I can show you is what, what we do here. So down here. start from the beginning. So here's a couple of miners, oaky giants. Now the reason I've chosen these to show you because there is another tip which we get asked a lot over here, you probably maybe know over where you are, um, how do we get them so tall? And the way I found what works with them for me here for sure is that I treat them almost as a biannual with their pictures. I find they really do need their old pictures left on them as long as possible. Whereas flowers, alertas, and leucos, you can cut them all down every year. We leave a lot of the old pictures on right up till, well, till now even. I've only just, I've only just trimmed these up so they look a bit tidier. We even leave them on like this as long as possible. They're still taking nourishment in. And I find by leaving the old pictures on longer, you will get much bigger traps on them. So that's, that's quite a good tip. Now, as far as crossing the plants is concerned, the reason we're using miners again is because they flower a lot later, so I'm sure you're all aware. All our flowers are over and finished now. But this one, for example, I use this. It's a piece of aluminium, aluminum wire. It's been flattened out at the end to make like a spoon. Can you see that there? Yes, we can. Is that clear? Yep. I don't use a paintbrush, I use this and I'll show you why. So if you can zoom in, Patia, get the pedal up. I'll just put my glasses on. <laughs> Easier. Right, can you see here my spatula? Yes. Not much pull in this one, but I can just there. Yeah. Like that, yeah. You can see the, the pollen there. Let's do the this is that to pass it on. Now the reason I use these are because you can really drive the pollen home on the stigma. Also, they're very easy to clean in water when you move to the next flower for sure you just wash it in water and clean it off and you know it's, it's spotlessly clean um another point i would say is that now it's 20 past two here in the afternoon over here the time that they take best the plants is between midday and two o'clock in the afternoon the, the plants are very receptive the stigmas are receptive and the pollen sticks on really well where you're over there in Florida or some warmer parts of, of the world, you might find you can pollinate them in the morning, but I'd noticed myself that the pollen just falls off them when it's quite cold, because over here in the morning it is, it is rather cold. 
But round about midday or 12.30 to two o'clock in the greenhouse here, it's about 25 to 30 degrees centigrade. They take well and they seem a lot more receptive and we get good crosses. Now I've been doing that for about six or seven years now and we get good, uh, a good pollination. We get some, uh, you know, we get a good seed rate off of the plants that we pollinate. In the past, we were pollinating, seed pods were, were swelling, but they were empty, there was nothing in them. So I think that works quite well for us. Then the seed pod will start to swell, which they're already here on this Moria, you can see here. Yeah. And this is a, a RH27, which is a, a, a Moriae, which is crossed with an Oreophylla, crossed with a Moriae again. So in September, we'd collect the seed, store them over winter in a dry envelope in a refrigerator. And we sow our seeds on the top of peat, pots of peat and perlite mix. So we would just use, this is our mix here. This is what we use. Sphagnum based peat from Lithuania mixed with perlite. So just potted about that. And then the seeds are just sprinkled gently on the top, on the surface. I never bury them, always on the soil surface. These are this year's seedlings. These were sown earlier this year. You can see we've got quite a good germination rate on them. There's a few that haven't germinated yet, but that's pretty good. Once they get to this size, we then use this sort of uh, these half seed trays, which are ideal, which we fill up again. Prick out the seedlings carefully. I mean, you can use these again for that. Matt, how old are those seedlings? These germinated this season. So these are about two months old. That's all, just about two months old. You pop them up into the seed tray, about that far apart. Because there's one I've done earlier over here. Can you see this? Yes. And what I'll do here, sometimes to push them on a bit, we use these on the top, just to give them a little bit of oomph <laughs> to get them going a bit. And that pushes them on a bit quicker. Um, feeding. Uh, we do sometimes give them a very light feed. We have used maxi, and we've used wheat seaweed fertilizer, but in very, very small amounts. I would add, I never feed any of our big plants. Once they're over four to five years old, we don't feed them. I find it can even wash out some of the color of some of them. It's almost like they're getting enough feed, they don't bother trying to catch insects, and I find it, they're a bit anemic. Whereas if they're... Uh, kept hungry, they produce much brighter coloured pictures. They might well put more size on with a bit of feed, but colour-wise, it's a bit a bit uh, washed out. So from this size here to something like this, for me here in Southern England, would take about six or seven years. I don't know it's like where you are, but that gives you an idea of how long they take. Now, a quicker way, to produce good sized plants or, and true cultivar types is rhizome cutting. So as you know, the Saracenia produces a rhizome. This is one out of its pot. So we strip all the old leaf scales off, clean. And you can strip this right back really clean. Can you see down in here? Really, really clean. They need to be. And then as long as you've got at least four or five roots on the front and the back, you can cut it with a pair of scissors. But this is a great example of one that's just not ready. Can you see here? All the roots from the back, there's nothing on the front. That's typical. A lot of, especially with Luca Phyla, I find then it's hybrid. You get that quite a lot. That one, you could take a rhizome cutting from right back here, or you could just go ahead and repot it, put it back into a pot again and wait until next year, which is what I would do with this one. So in the way I pot them, I hold them up at the back and then around the front. And I really push them in half. There's little things like this that 
I find make all the difference. If they're, I find if they're not really pushed in hard, they don't get too tall. So pushed in really hard, rise on right up on soil surface, and then that plant can make its way across the top of the pot. Once it starts pushing the pot out of shape, then it'll be repotted again. But getting back to the rhizome cuttings, here are some that I've taken earlier. You see them here? So these are the rhizomes above soil surface of a Saracenia very maxima. And then I find in about four to six months, they start to sprout and then end up with this. See here? Now, there's a little one there. That's a new one just starting at the end of my finger now. Can you see that one there? Yeah, are you usually doing the, are you doing the rhizome cuttings in the winter? All year round, Kenny. Okay. What we, have that we have to do them all year round. If there's a right time to do it, I would say February is your best time. But because we're quite busy on the nursery, we, we find we have to do our propagation cuts all year round. And um, yeah, because we're just so busy. But the right time, I would say, is February. But you so, can do a rhizome cutting in the summer and then still four to five months later. If you do it in the summer, you've got to make sure that your rhizome cutting and your front end of your plant that you've removed is extremely well hydrated. So stand them in trays of water up here because it's going to upset the plant, obviously, taking half its root system away. Yeah. So keep them in really deep water and then you can do it in the summer. Yes, you can. Yep. But Sus Susan Mitchell has a question. Yep. She has a Saracenia rhizome that didn't grow this year. The plant's yep. about three years old. And she was wondering, is there a way to, the rhizome is still firm, but is there a way to wake it up? Yeah, we get a few. Uh, we'll go and look at some in a minute that do that. And they can sometimes bypass the growing season. Firstly, don't give up on it, keep it. But what you could do, because it isn't going to harm it, if it hasn't started to, to do anything like this one here, take them out of, take them out of their pot. Right? Have a good look at them. Take off any more scales. If, uh, has she done this? And make sure it's still white, creamy white. This is a really good tip I found. <laughs> you see the roots on top? I find if you take some of those off, they can sometimes it can sometimes force them to, to sprout. So clean them right up, really clean. Obviously, make sure you've got enough roots on the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me. So that one's okay. Take some of those off of there. An old toothbrush is great to scrub them on top. That can help them break through. It's almost like, it seems to me, you'll help them to break through, you know, or break out. If you've got rot on the end, cut that right back. So, because obviously you can get botrytis or gray mold. So these are okay, but cut them back. So nice and clean, both ends, roots are okay. Like this, yeah. We put those back so she could do that with them, clean them all up, back down in and give them another go. Whereabouts do, does she live, Kenny? Where part of this? Is she from the States? I will wait for her to reply. Because hmm. I was going to say, if she's in a warm part, she's in California or something, maybe she might want to pop it in the fridge just to, you know, stratify it a little, get it a bit cold. Um, she she lives in uh, North Carolina. Carolina, well, she could <laughs> she could just leave them outside, I would think, and or <laughs> just give it another another extra boost, put something like that over the top as well. So clean it all up, cut it back, stand it in rainwater, a propagating lid, just to give it a little push, and have another go. Never throw them away. I mean, I mean, when I've been to see them in the states, I've seen some stand where they've. And I've seen them on the CP, uh, ICPS uh, website where 
plants have actually gone dormant and bypassed a year or two and they've had more light and then they come up. So mm -hmm. it does happen, but as long as it's turgid, white and healthy, there is a good chance of it, of it coming up. Now, um, it's yeah. worth doing. You get the hang of doing it because um, it's, the, it's the quickest way if you're an amateur grower to, to produce clonal plants or plants that are the same as, as the original. Have a look, look up here, Kenny. I think if we can, I'll show you some I've done this this year. Can you still see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, let me have a look at a fly, big fly trap while we're passing. This is a big one. You see that? <laughs> That's Southwest Giant. It's a cultivar made by a friend of mine down in Devon. It's a rather big one. Some of our fly traps, but we'll look up here. These here are all rhizome cuttings, Kenny. Everything here. This year, so we've got the hanger doing this now, and they come up really, really strong. And these are this year's rhizome cuttings. So I'm exceptionally pleased with these. Some of these are looking like, you know, like four-year-old plants. So uh, yeah, no. don't get carried away. Um, you've got to leave them. Let them put roots down. I have seen people where they remove them far too soon. I mean, th these can't be divided up yet, that none of these will have put down enough of, a, of a, an individual root system, or the root system will still be on the main old rhizome. So have a look every now and then. I'd, I'd, next time I would look at these would be next, late next spring to see if they've got their own root system. They can they'd be self-supporting and can uh, be potted up individually. But a great way to produce uh, to produce new plants. Now, so, any, sorry? Yeah, so these rhizomes are, are plants that you are enjoying, that you like, that you want to reproduce. Can you tell us how do you call or wean out the seedlings? How, how do you identify which ones are going to be more colorful, right. more stronger? Do you have to hang on to them for years? We'll come down, we're in the right place for that. Come down here. Yeah. This table here has four crosses. These are all seedlings. I find you've got to grow them on for at least three or four years. You can't jump. Like, you can't go picking them out at two years. But they they won't they won't hold the good traits that they have at two. They can wash out. So once they're three or four. They're reasonable when they move over here. These are better than these. Okay, here. Size, colour and vigour. Some of these in here look great, but they're quite slow. Um, an example is something like, I mean, this one's not great and it's slow. <laughs> but that really is uh, just a Saracenia hybrid. I mean, that would be ideal for someone that just wants to to grow picture plants to Saracenia. You know, it's, it's nothing special. It's just a, a non, you know, Saracenia hybrid, but the nicer ones can be picked out. But basically, Kenny, you've got to grow them on, I find, for three or four years at least, five years even better here where we are. So um, I wouldn't imagine our summers are as long as, say, for example, South Carolina. So we've got quite a short growing season. I've just spotted this one. Look at this. Yeah, that's really nice. And that's a flower atro purpurea kimber red ruffles across the Luca Phyla pink lip. So that's a really nice plant. It grows reasonably quickly. I like this really dark stripe down the top here. That's a good plant. And that's the sort of thing when it gets a bit bigger, we'd cut the rhizome off and propagate up. I think what keeps the Saracenia quite collectible over here and probably in the States is that, yeah, they are relatively slow. Um, unless you get things put in tissue culture, if you're just you know producing stuff from rhizome cutting, 
it's a slow process and the plant has to arise on big enough to cut before you can start doing that. So um, yeah, this is a, another one. This is a layer Wilkinson across with a, a Rita sofa. It's got a nice big red splotch in the back. And can you see it's got this nice red ring around the lid? So that's nice, I like that. But then I suppose it's, it's horses for courses as well because there's some things that I look at in here that I don't like, but other growers come and say, oh, I like that one. So it's individual choice, isn't it, really? I don't think you can say one is better than another one. But are there any other questions, Kenny, before we move out of this part? When do you personally decide if something's going to be a cultivar, a named cultivar? Uh, when I've, I've, got, I've got quite a few in here that can. When I've grown it on for about five or six years, We've just named one. We are going to register it with the ICPS for Alan Hindle. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, but in the, in the Saracenia world over here, um, when I first got into growing them, it was, you know, Venus fly traps, Adrian Slack. But Alan Hindle was from Leon Solent near here. And I went down to his conservatory a number of years ago, and I just could not believe the range of colours and varieties he had of different flower forms. And that really got me into growing this genera more than, and more than anything else. Alan's plants were just the best in the UK. And a lot of his cultivars are still around over here. And a lot of the good hybrids that are around came from Alan's plants. So he really got me going with growing different Saracenia. And I named one for him over here. He came down the other day. I don't know if you can see it over here. This unusual lid. This one. Now that's different. <laughs> It does that, it's reliable. <laughs> the, first time it, the first time it did that, I wasn't sure if it would be stable, whether it would do it again. But it's done it now. I've had the plan, I've got a few divisions of it. Alan's got a bit of it, obviously. It's a stable and I think that's, that's a good cultivar. So I would say, before you name one, about five, five six years. I've got a lot here with clonal numbers on them. Like that one there's, that's not named, it's H27 with the big red splotch in the back of its neck. Um, it's very, very big. It's got a clonal number, but it's not named properly yet. So yeah, about five years, yeah. We have a comment that says they've been growing Saracenia for a few years, and it's a pleasure to see someone who does it professionally showing how they do it. And- <laughs> Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome, yeah. And we have another <laughs> comment, and this is a, a good question because I also have the same problem. My yeah. pitchers uh, grow outside and there's lots yeah. of wind and weather. Do you have a preferred method yeah. to keep them upright? Should we go outside and have a look at some in a minute? We'll go outside. Now, um, we're in quite a windy low here. I think you got to choose Honestly, but the biggest problem I, I have with them is not so much the wind, but when they fill up with, with rainwater and the weight of that can make them go over. We yeah. don't use any wind breaks here. I mean, if you can, um, a friend of mine, Tom, Tom Skinner, he's got a, a lovely bog garden and it's got a hedge around it, which does protect it. And it's an old pond that he's filled in with peat and put his plants in and they look spectacular and they stay upright really well. But personally, I don't use any wind breaks, but I would use not too uh, things like uh, Judith Hindle, Saracenia oreophylla does very, very well outside. North Carolina flowers that aren't too big. Um, Purpurea, Michelianas, so intermediate type plants. Stick with those type, obviously Purpurea, Catsbii, Cortii, those sort of hybrids. Wispy ones, we don't, I mean, Leucophylla just goes like that, as does Alata. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> don't even grow them. <laughs> no, just uh, stick with stocky intermediate crosses is best. And if you're lucky enough to have a, a hedge around, place your bog garden there. Or if you've got a planter, make sure it's got sun sun from morning to night. Sun's vital outside, but um, yeah, just try and keep it a bit protected. I don't stake any plants. I don't like the look of it. I don't like to see that. If they blow over, I'll be honest, I cut the ones off that have blown over. <laughs> That's what we do here. So, All right. look at the ones outside. 
Sure. So those questions were from Gonzalo and uh, Don Schiller. And then we also have a question from Christian. My plants aren't producing nectar and are dry inside. Any suggestions? Strange. Um, how long has he been growing? You, um, if, if they're not, I mean, not all of them produce lots and lots of nectar. I'm just looking at mine, for example. That one does. Can you see in here? This one has, whereas this one hasn't got much on it. Now, I wouldn't say it's the end of the world. If he's starting to get browning around the top of the lid, around here, at this time of year, then I would say it's low, low humidity. That's what's causing it. And if he's got them in a, in a low, dry area, then that's, it possibly is that. Keep them very, very well hydrated. That can help. Deep water again. Lots of sun. But um, I don't get that problem here. It hasn't caused me any problems. So I'm not really, I'm not really sure how, I'm the right person to answer that question. But that's not a, that's not a problem we've had. Uh, yeah, if you want to take us outside, he said that uh, it's his second year growing them. Yeah, and, and he's quite arid. Where he is, does he say? Does he say where he is? Waiting on that. Okay, we're going to have a look outside. He's in uh, San Diego, California. Right, yeah, it's probably quite hot and dry. That, I mean, if the rest of the plant's okay, I, I would tell him not to worry too much about it. As long as it's upright and it's not going brown, the, nectar, the amount of nectar they produce, not all of them produce you know, bags and bags of nectar. Some of them you can hardly see any on them. So I wouldn't say it's the end of the world, but if he's getting browning around the edge of the lid, that's a sign of too low a humidity or drying out. So, um, and they're currently well, sitting in two to three inches of water. Yeah, well, do you know what, what, what varieties he's got there? Is it hybrids or flowers or? Oh, it's lovely. It's, it's a nice sunny day now, look. Don't get this very often. <laughs> About an hour ago, Matt was concerned it was going to be raining. It was. There we are. So I'm super pleased with this. This is our bog garden. Um, it's done far better than expected. The southwesterly wind from the Solent, which is the sea south of us, next bit of land's France, comes up through here. And you can see we've got a stake to stake up. Lots of pine. We do get very windy weather, but um, yeah, they're all looking fine at the moment. And the construction of our bog here, is, these are railway sleepers. And we've got one on edge and one on the top. This is lined with a plastic liner and then it's filled up with old secondhand peat that we've used from the, from the repotting the plants in the greenhouse. It's completely undrained. There's no holes in the liner. And when it rains heavily, which it has rained today, you can see there's water in here, the water just overflows the top. And the plants are doing exceptionally well. I'm so pleased with them. I mean, they're growing as well as they are under glass. They flower really, really well. Um, the bumblebees love the flowers. We've got bumblebees here. This is one just gone to this one. They're coming out in a minute. There. <laughs> um, virtually all the flowers uh, get pollinated out here, and they're a magnet for bumblebees. The bumblebees don't go into the traps, by the way, so much. They just go to the to the flowers. But um, oh, if you haven't grown them outside, it's really worth it's really worth a try. In the winter. It's completely frozen. They get covered in snow as well. Because so many people ask us, well, when do you bring them in the greenhouse? Well, they don't they just stay out here all the time. So uh, if you're in a zone eight or to nine, um, 
you should get results like this. But also what has come up, which is great, can you see here these small drops there? This is Intermedia. There's Rotundifolia there. These are British natives that have just come up in the bog. Starting to grow away here. Um, the plants drop their own seed, the Saracenia, and we do have young seedlings starting to grow. There on the other side here. This is a Saracenia oreophylla, main one. This is just coming up. This is Judith Hindle, purpurea venosa, purpurea purpurea. This one here is Brooks hybrid, which is a Morii, and and you can see the bases of the of the uh, picture very thick and sturdy and strong. This one. They are really, really well rooted down into the bog. Um, I find there is there is no need to change the medium. As long as it overflows, it seems to flush itself through. And this medium was in another bog garden further up there. And it's about seven, eight years old. So and it's absolutely fine. The plants catch loads of flies out here. And I don't think they need, it doesn't need replenishing at all. They do very, very well. Yeah, what do you think, Kelly? They look good, don't they? Yeah, they're beautiful. So Morii is a cross between Flava and Leucophylla. Do yep. you do, do you do really complex hybrids or yeah. are you favoring, you know? Pr primary, no, we now that that's a really good question. Before I used to do, I was quite a few years doing primary hybrids, but now we try and do as complex as possible because you get far more variation <laughs> in the seedlings. Um, it's, it's much better, it's better fun. You get all sorts coming up, you get some really unusual shapes, colors and sizes. So I think we haven't done any primary crosses for that's about three years now. They're nearly all quite complex and they're coming through and they're coming through now. Down across with Mori eyes or other name cold smoke back crossed. Uh, I'm trying to do more crosses with minor as well, which, uh, although that is a species, um, they're trying to get some just some different shapes. He's asking, how important is it to grow them in rainwater? I have always used distilled water. I'm starting to try tap water as an experience, as an experiment. And, uh, right. So what are you thinking? Right, uh, first of all, it depends where you live and what your water's like. Where we live here, we're in the, in the, the, south, the end of the South Downs in Hampshire. And the South Downs consists a lot of chalk. So our water is very, very, very hard. If we used our tap water on these, they wouldn't be looking like this. And Venus fly traps, it kills them in about four or five weeks. It's a delayed reaction as well, even with fly traps. When you first use it, you think, oh, that's a load of rubbish what he said, they're fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, seriously, then it comes on a few weeks later, they start to go yellow around the edges, the fly traps, and then black. And that's when the rot sets in and the damage is done then. So um, distilled water is great, or water's gone through a, a reverse osmosis filter you can use that with uh, no problems at all. It's fine. Um, there are some people over here that live down near um, Devon Way with their waters. It's slightly acidic or neutral to acidic, and they're fine with that. But here it's uh, it's very, very, very hard and we, we can't use it. So it depends what your water is like. If you check the TDS, you use a TDS meter. Mm -hmm. If you're up to around about, uh, well, up to be honest you can go up to about 40 with it even with fly traps but once you get i mean our water here is touching 300 parts per million yeah so it's good it's not good so these we have uh two large tanks behind the glass house where we collect twenty-five thousand gallons and it rains a lot here <laughs> uh, we get a lot of rain every day nearly so um we got we got plenty of that, but the main problem I find is is not the rain; it's having the storage. If you've got the storage, um, 
you know, it can be, a, you, you'll, you'll get enough rainwater. It's having enough storage. Yeah. All right, yeah. that question was from Gonzalo. Now, uh, Don Schiller wants to know, what's the depth of your bog? Right, yeah, that's a brilliant question. Not as deep as it looks, Don. That, that, we've got a, a sleep on the side, one on the top, like that, and we dug a footing. And all the soil from the footing is put back in. So some of this is only about three or four inches deep. So it undulates, it goes up and down. The plants don't need that much depth at all, right? So uh, you really don't need, but I'll be honest, the deeper it is, the less often you'll need to water them. This year, we've watered this bog four times this year and filled it right up. Other than that, the rain has done it itself. It's been fine. So if you've got the peat to spare, you can do it as deep as you want, but I, there's no need to go any deeper than eight to 10 inches maximum. There's just no need. They've all got a relatively meager root system on them. They don't go right down with tap roots or anything. So yeah. no need to, um, to, to waste peat with too deep a, a bog. And you can sort of use space up with, with rocks. There's a rock there. Um, and while we're here, I wanted to show you, Kenny, that um, this is Saracenia leucophylla. It just doesn't do very well here. We're probably not quite warm enough. Also, Saracenia citicina for us here is not that great. So I've stuck with what works, which are like Micheliana hybrids, Oreophylla, North Carolina flowers, hybrids, but not uh, leucophylla species. So your the pictures outside are as beautiful as the ones inside. What's the biggest pot that you would have them for an, one individual Saracenia? What's the biggest pot you would recommend? Oh, we'll have a look. We've got enough time just to go in and have a look at some big ones. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> um, so, and Kadim wanted to know. We just saw some anthocyanin free, um, probably Saracenia purpureas. Are you? Yep. Are you breeding them or doing clones of pigment-free? We've been, we've done we've yeah we've done a few crosses with anthro-free leuco with anthro-free flava to make anthro-free morii. We've got anthro-free cortii, anthro-free um, what else? Oh, Ruba jonesii crossed with. Purpurea. I'm not sure what the name of that course is, but Jones I anthro cross with um, purpurea, purpurea. We've got a few, we've got a few, and, but I don't look, again, like I've said to you before, I don't like someone that just hang on. Um, the the flower one I've cloned, I've got, and the Luca clone are extremely vigorous, which I've crossed this year because they just grow so quickly. I hope we get a really super quick growing, all green, almost white Moria. Got a few. Are we still, you still got us? Yes, we have about nine minutes to go. Okay. We'll, we'll try up here, we'll look at some big ones. Enough. It's about as big as we go. <laughs> that one, that's about 25 litre. That's a flower all red from Blackwater. That came from Alan Hindle. That's an old plant. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a big one. We had, we had a lot like this but they're too heavy. Um, the reason we've got the big plants, they're all for, uh, for flower shows, for display. And we never use the same plants um, at, the, at different shows. So we, we alternate them. Yeah. See, big pots don't make big plants, see that? <laughs> you don't need a really, really big pot. They like to be restricted. Um, yeah. All right. 
So, you know, this one will probably go. We're going to a flower show next week, BBC Garden as well. So this will probably go. Because it's all the way around, nice and clean. And up here, we've got the red ones, which are slow. I'm sure you know people are growing. There's some red ones here. These are reds in different parts of the stones. Not as big as they used to be, sadly, but they're big enough. We've repotted a lot this year as well. So these are our big plants. And we had a huge repot this year. So a lot of these, or virtually all of our uh, display plants here, were repotted uh, February, March. Aren't they, Patty? We've done them all, didn't we? So, uh, yeah, but so I don't know if you uh, people that are watching find this, but after a repot, usually it washes a lot of colour out of them. And these have been darker than this. I mean, these over the years, I've selected that really dark red ones. This is, see, I consider that washed out. That's not, that's not a good red, really. Um, I don't want to find out that's not too bad. I want them to be sort of really good, you know, a good dark red, really. And next year they'll be fantastic. They really will because they'll have settled down a bit. You can see they've been repotted. Yeah. And next year they'll be spectacular, I'm sure. So I'm really looking forward to to next season, really. Uh, it, uh, we didn't go to Chelsea Flower Show this year, which is the biggest flower show here in the UK, but we're going next year. And our display will be, I think it'll be spectacular. So I'm really, really looking forward to it because everything will have settled down, we'll have good colour in them. I'm very jealous, you know, these are the dark ones. And that one So these are, uh, we've got courtyard out there, courtyard is crossed with her prayer, her prayer. Yeah. So if it gets that dark over here, I would imagine it would get very, very dark in the States because your light levels are, are quite high. So there's some more minor crosses to look at. Any other questions, Kelly? Do you think or have you seen the heat affect the color or just the amount of light? Yeah, very much heat, extremely important, definitely. It's only the last few years I've been thinking that way as well. The heat is important. They like to be warm, very warm. We're shut down today. Um, and temperature wise, about uh, about 30 in here today, 30C. So what's that, about 80, 80 90? Is it 85, 90, I think? Yeah. About 30 you, in here today. Do you have any problems with the heat affecting plants in smaller pots? Not really. We keep them very well hydrated. And again, we've whitewashed. We've whitewashed the roof. But we're still getting, there are other growers in this country that keep their glass really, really clear. But I find we get the colour just as much as they do with whitewashed roof, but we're very, very warm. So I think we've had problems before with very clear glass with, the, with, with like I was saying before, round the edges going brown of the traps. We just don't get that. The plants last a lot longer through the year. So we can display plants in September even. Some we struggle with flower a bit, but any of the more uh, hybrid still look good into September. So temperature doesn't. I think it's the sunlight which can um, shorten the life of the pictures more than anything. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. So if anyone else has some questions, feel free to type it in. Pests and disease, and we'll talk about that. A bit. Oh, yeah. So I was actually going <laughs> yeah. to mention that. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. So we yep. had a full one hour webinar with Damon Collinsworth on pest and diseases. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. But Matt, can you kind of quickly tell us, do you do it annually or do you do it as needed? And what do you use? Pests and diseases, insect wise, the problems we get are green fly, which people think it's not bad, but I think it's one of the worst because they also spread virus. We spray early spring, just as the pictures are coming up with a systemic insecticide. To keep that away. The other two problems are scale, removing old foliage. Scale very slow moving, and I find that they invariably they're on the older leaves. If you can keep the plants clean and tidy, very rarely do you see scale insect on new clean pictures. The only species we do still get it with occasionally are Dullingtonia and Saracenia minor because we leave the pictures on there longer. But other than that, fine. The other one is mealybug, which is a pain and difficult to eradicate. Um, you have to clean back almost everything back to the roots and repot. Uh, they're quite difficult. We do spray and we alternate with uh, systemic and contact because a lot of the time the mealybug aren't actually eating anything. So when they're at a crawler stage, you need to use uh, a contact spray. And when they're starting to feed, then you need the systemic. So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act. So those are the three problems we have insect wise. Fungus, fungal wise, we've, we virtually don't have any problems at all. We've got, uh, we've got a, uh, oh, a sulfur smoker that, that we have going at nights which releases sulfur, which keeps powdery mildew at bay. But by removing all dead foliage, we hardly ever get botrytis snail under glass. We ventilate very, very well in the winter, even when it's freezing. I've turned the fans off. We've got circulating fans all around the nursery. That's a really good tip. If you've just got a small fan giving you a buoyant moving air, that can really, really help. Um, if you look behind here, there's a big one up there. You can see it up there at the end of the greenhouse? Yes. That's, but it's very noisy, but it's not, it's not terrible, but you pick it up on here, that's why we've turned them all off. But we've got them throughout, we're looking inside here. From a nursery or breeder uh, perspective, are you selling younger plants that you already have experience with then? So you can offer clients a different, you know, a range of different sizes or do you prefer to sell older plants? With both. For beginners, we sell them about three-year-old plants, this sort of size. Um, this sort of size to get people into growing the hobby, but we also cater for the really keen collectors who want the ones in the other greenhouse we've just been to, the really nice select cultivars. Years ago, I was just growing species, it's what I was interested, but to be honest, there at the end of the day, there's only a couple of handfuls of species, hundreds on the way forward with Saracenia, I feel. Um, and they're a lot more collectible than they used to be. I can remember years ago when people just wouldn't even look at a hybrid, but now, well, it's like with every group of plants, look at fuchsias or pelagoniums, it's all hybrids, orchids, everything seems to go that way in time. It's, uh, yeah, once you've got all the species, you want something else, don't you? So, uh, yeah, unusual hybrids for the king collectors, young plants, uh, for the, for the beginners. I mean, a great one is uh, Judith Hindle, it's a fantastic plant to start with, which I know is available in the states. It's a great plant. And our one Bella over there is a good one. Just literally out across Luca Fina. That's a good one to start with. Purpurea venosa is a great plant to start with. Yeah. So start with those and then build up the collection, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So Alan Hindle named Judith Hindle. Named for his wife. Yeah. 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 And now, and your new cultivar is going to be called Alan Hindle or something related to that? Alan Hindle. Yeah. It's named for Alan himself. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Very good. All right. Well, Matt, we are out of time. Everybody, we have lots of comments coming in saying fantastic presentation. We have lots of uh, 
North American people saying it was a great way to start their day because it's only 10 a.m. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Daniel says, thank you, Matt. Great to hear from you. Kadeem says, very enlightening. And uh, we encourage everyone to check out Matt's uh, website, Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. Oh, thanks, Kenny. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Matt. This was wonderful. All right, well. <laughs> All right. Don Schiller says, I learned a lot, even though I've been growing for many years. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, thanks, Don. Uh, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. Yeah. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.